you all for tuning in to our second presenter. Um, this is part two of our speaker series. And I am delighted to be able to introduce Donald K. Carter. Uh, Don Carter is a senior research fellow at the Remaking Cities Institute at Carnegie Mellon University, where he was the director from 2009 to 2019. And from 2010 to 2017, he was also track chair for the Master of Urban Design program. Prior to joining Carnegie Mellon in 2009, Don was a in private practice for 36 years at Urban Design Associates in Pittsburgh. He is a fellow of the American Institute of Architects and a fellow of the American Institute of Certified Planners. Don earned a Bachelor of Architecture degree from Carnegie Mellon University and did postgraduate study in urban design and regional planning at the University of Edinburgh, Scotland. Thank you so much for joining us today, Don. I look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Amalia, and greetings from Pittsburgh. And, excuse me, from Carnegie Mellon University. I'll be speaking on remaking post small post industrial cities. My talk will be in two parts. Part one will be lessons learned from 10 post industrial cities in the US and Europe. In part two, I will examine five small post-industrial cities in the Pittsburgh region through the lens of those lessons learned. Part one, Remaking Cities is the subject of my book, Remaking Post-Industrial Cities, Lessons from North America and Europe. It's focused on the 30 year period from 2085, <clears throat> excuse me, to 2015 and features five US cities and five European cities. The US cities are Pittsburgh, Buffalo, Detroit, New Orleans, Milwaukee and New Orleans. And that's Pittsburgh over the span of eight years in the 1980s. 133,000 high paying industrial jobs were lost. In the European cities are Bilbao, Spain, Turin, Italy, Ruhr region, Germany, Rotterdam, Netherlands, and Liverpool, England. In Turin, the historic Fiat Motor Works closed in 1980 with a loss of 23,000 jobs. But these 10 post-industrial cities have come back in the last 30 years, and some a little more successfully than others. And there are lessons to be learned from their regeneration. And it was surprising how much congruence there was from city to city. <clears throat> The first lesson is it takes time. None of these transformations happened overnight. It took decades of hard work, successes, mistakes, and even restarts. For example, the redevelopment of the industrial Menominee Valley in Milwaukee has been ongoing since the 1980s. Milwaukee, once a center of steelmaking and breweries, is still not giving up on manufacturing. In Bilbao, starting in 1987, it took 25 years to complete the first two lines of the Bilbao Metro, as well as the tram system. The scale is metropolitan. <clears throat> Bruce Katz, who was with the Brookings Institution at the time, proclaimed in his 2013 book, The Metropolitan Revolution, that regions are where the action is and will be in the future. There is no real national urban agenda. Katz says the federal government has left the building. The best example of regionalism in my book is the Ruhr region, once the steel and coal heartland of Germany, where 53 cities are acting as one region. You need a long-term vision. Unfortunately, it often takes a dramatic economic downturn or a natural disaster for city leadership to come together for a vision of rebuilding and transforming the city. This rather innocuous document from 1985 is the cover page of the most important transformative effort after the collapse of Pittsburgh's manufacturing economy. Strategy 21 was a consortium of the city of Pittsburgh, the County of Allegheny, the University of Pittsburgh, and Carnegie Mellon University. Strong emphasis was placed on diversifying the economy, but government support at the state and federal 
level was still needed and essential. However, unlike in the past, when they applied for government grants kind of willy-nilly, each group asking for its own piece of pie, it was decided to prepare one short list of must-have projects and for the city and the county to be unified in their lobbying efforts. Four high-profile projects were targeted. Construction of a new international airport terminal, winning the competition for the Software Engineering Institute at Carnegie Mellon University, receiving one of five federally funded supercomputers, and being designated the National Robotics Engineering Center at Carnegie Mellon University. By the 1990s, all four were in place. In Buffalo, another city that lost its steel industry in the 1980s, One Region Forward was published in 2015 after three years of community engagement. Diversify the economy. For the last 30 years, now 35 years, these 10 cities have striven to replace lost jobs in their basic industries, trying to find new jobs in technology, medicine, education, services, tourism, and value-added manufacturing. Now, Pittsburgh may be the most exemplary. The engines for that transformation of Pittsburgh were the universities and the medical center in the Oakland neighborhood. In the foreground, you can see Carnegie Mellon, in the middle ground is the University of Pittsburgh and the five research hospitals of the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. In the background, just a few miles away, is downtown. Today, Pittsburgh indeed has a diverse economy, with legacy headquarter companies still in place like U.S. Steel, Alcoa, Heinz, and PPG. But Pittsburgh has the largest number of Google employees outside of Silicon Valley in New York City. Pittsburgh is also the location of research centers for Amazon, Apple, and Uber. Uber, which last year located its testbed for autonomous vehicles in Pittsburgh. In fact, that was two years ago. But even Detroit, kind of the poster child for post-industrial decline, is coming back. Sure, there are abandoned neighborhoods like on the upper left and closed factories. But Quicken Loans, with 11,000 total employees in the region, located its headquarters in downtown. 2010. And startups like the Shinola Watch Company are emblematic of a new entrepreneurial spirit. Shinola went from 20 employees in 2012 to over 400 in 2019. Another example is the reuse of the abandoned Inchet factory in the outskirts of Turin. The historic buildings are being restored as ex Inchet, a mixed use development of housing, offices, business incubator spaces and university buildings. A key program inside it all is Open InChat, an innovation center that connects people and ideas and supports entrepreneurship. Be bold, take risks, another lesson. Cities in distress often look for a silver bullet to turn things around, perhaps attracting a new company or building a sports stadium or museum or even hosting a major international event. These can work if they're combined with an overall vision of how the silver bullet is part of a long-term strategy. They can also fail if they're standalone efforts not tied to regeneration. The most famous example of a successful silver bullet is the 1997 Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao. The museum was a key element in the long-range strategy to revitalize the city after the disastrous flood of the Nervian River in 1983. The 2001 Milwaukee Art Museum and the 2006 Winter Olympics in Turin were also bold risks that paid off because they were part of a long-term strategy. You can't do it alone. The five U.S. case studies document the increasing use of public-private partnerships. This is a really relatively new economic development technique that has evolved in the U.S. since the 1950s. In essence, government works with philanthropic foundations, for-profit developers, and not-for-profit developers to finance and implement projects. Often 10 or more funding sources are cobbled together to make a project happen. Here is an example of a public-private partnership in Buffalo, where the city, county, and the nonprofit Olmsted Parks Conservancy formed a partnership for the restoration and maintenance of the six historic parks 
and seven parkways designed by Frederick Law Olmsted, the father of American landscape architecture. Leadership is important. Turin offers a great example. Valentino Castellani, a college professor, was elected mayor in 1993, a watershed moment for the city. Castellani presided over the 1995 and 1998 city master plans, resulting in the successful bid for the 2006 Winter Olympics that led to the revitalization of the central city. In the Ruhr region, Dr. Carl Gonzer, from 1989 to 1999, led the International Building Exhibition that created the $3.5 billion Emscher Regional Landscape Park with over 100 industrial preservation and open space projects. Citizen engagement is also important. Top-down leadership was the norm after World War II on both sides of the Atlantic. Poor people, minorities, and immigrants had been particularly disenfranchised. However, outreach to citizens has become standard practice in the US and in fact, in most of Europe. For example, the 2013 Detroit Future City Plan had 163,000 individual stakeholder interactions over three years. The strategic plan of Turin in 2000 included a two year long public outreach effort and engaged a broad segment of civil society, the first process of its kind in Italy. Strengthen the central city. The emptying out of the central city was a major consequence of the collapse of big industry in the 1980s. It became clear that investments had to be made again in the core. In Pittsburgh, investments were made in bikeways and parks. The crown jewel is the Pittsburgh Cultural District in downtown on the lower right. It includes five performing arts theaters, restaurants, and art galleries, attracting 2.5 million visitors per year. Another example of center city investment is in Rotterdam, a port city like Bilbao that lost its shipbuilding industry to Asia. The market hall that opened in 2014 is a mixed use project consisting of apartments, fresh food stalls, a supermarket, and a public gathering space. Investment in culture, heritage, and quality of life must track parallel with economic revival. Cities have converted industrial buildings, brownfield sites, unused railroad lines, and abandoned docks to parks and trails combined with mixed use development. The redevelopment of the derelict Albert Dock in Liverpool in 1988 is a good example. Liverpool, once the busiest port in the world, lost 40,000 jobs in the 1980s and went into steep decline. Albert Dock was the start of its comeback. In 2003, Liverpool was named the European Capital of Culture for 2008. This year-long festival brought 10 million visitors to the city with a $1 billion economic impact. And there's the preservation and restoration of the unique culture of New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, including Mardi Gras, the African-American Indian Parade Clubs, street musicians, and the annual Jazz and Heritage Festival. Develop sustainably. The environmental movement has accomplished much since the first Earth Day, all those years ago in 1970. Its impact on the built environment has been profound for buildings, infrastructure, and public health. Now, climate change has added additional concerns, especially for low-lying co coastal cities like Rotterdam and New Orleans. Today, best practices in ecological planning on the right are being employed to prevent future catastrophes, like the deadly aftermath of Hurricane Katrina on the left in 2005. Lastly, and not surprising, coming from an architect and urban designer, good planning and urban design matter. Redevelopment mistakes where mistakes were made after World War I in the name of modernism in the US and in Europe. The intentions of community leaders and the planners were good for sure, but the designs were often devastatingly bad. Our cities have been recovering from these ill-conceived projects ever since. The rebuilding of Rotterdam after the extensive bombing in World War II is a case in point. Historic traditions were cast aside in favor of isolated housing blocks, like on the right, but with few amenities, such as shops and parks. This occurred not only in Rotterdam, 
at a cross war-torn Europe. In the US, similar mistakes were made in the name of Berber Manuel in the 1960s. The plans were based on new post-World War II mo modernist design principles that ignored the historic contents and the fine grain of those neighborhoods. In Pittsburgh here, 28 acres of the Lower Hill District were targeted for demolition. 8,000 residents, mostly African-American, and hundreds of businesses were displaced and replaced by a sports arena, boulevards, and lots of surface parking. But good de design and planning have prevailed in Pittsburgh. Market Square in downtown Pittsburgh was redesigned as a European piazza after decades of poor maintenance and a deserved reputation for crime and drugs. A new mixed income housing was built on the site of the Lower Hill District Urban Renewal Project we just looked at. Even small post-industrial cities like Chattanooga, Tennessee, Hamilton, Ontario, Bristol, England, and St. Etienne, France are being remade. I'll now turn to part two. In recent years, I've pivoted my research from big cities in the US and Europe to smaller mill towns in the river valleys of southwestern Pennsylvania. Many are still struggling, 40 years after the collapse of big steel and other basic industries in the 1980s. Some are beginning to resemble ghost towns, but others have begun to come back. In this concluding section, I will examine five towns that are revitalizing in the context of the lessons learned in part one. In the interest of time, I'll focus on just four lessons learned. You need a long-term vision, you can't do it alone, invest in culture and heritage, and develop sustainably. The towns are McKees Rocks, Etna, Millvale, Sharpsburg, and Johnstown. The borough of McKees Rocks is just six miles northwest of Pittsburgh, along the Ohio River. The boroughs of Millvale, Etna, and Sharpsburg are a few miles northeast of downtown Pittsburgh along the Allegheny River. These three boroughs recently formed the Triborough Echo District. Johnstown, the fifth and largest town, is 60 miles, 65 miles east of Pittsburgh along the Connemaw River. You can see the red dot there of Johnstown. The five towns have much in common. They were all ancient sites of Native American settlements by virtue of being at the confluence of creeks meeting rivers. They subsequently, of course, were locations of French and English trading posts in the 18th century. Here's a depiction of George Washington negotiating with Seneca chief Guy Suda in 1753 at the future site of McKees Rocks. The extension of the Pennsylvania Canal to Western Pennsylvania in 1831 and the Pennsylvania Railroad in 1851 led to the expansion of industry and population in the Pittsburgh region. By the, 19th, by the middle of the 19th century, the Pittsburgh region had become a global just industrial giant because of the railroad, barges on the rivers, nearby coal and iron deposits, and a strong workforce. Pittsburgh was producing 50% of the iron and steel in the world. The early settlers and immigrants in the 18th century and 19th century front to these small towns were initially from England and Scotland, soon followed by immigrants from Germany and Ireland. In the late 19th century, immigrants began arriving from Italy and Eastern Europe to work in the mills and mines. After World War I, blacks from the South migrated north for industrial jobs. Most river towns prior to the 1960s had ethnic enclaves centered around churches and social halls, where Ukrainians would be here, Irish there, Polish there, Jews there, Italians here, Blacks there, and so on. Settlement houses, fraternal organizations, lyceums, festivals, newspapers, and sports teams represented each group seeking to preserve their culture and their heritage. So case studies, McKees Rocks is the first case study. McKees Rocks is at the confluence of Chartiers Creek on the left, which, where it flows into the Ohio River at the bottom of the slide. You can see in the foreground along the Ohio River, the shop buildings of the Pennsylvania and Lake Erie Railroad here in 1901, many of which remain today, 
but are vacant. As I showed earlier, George Washington was at this site in 1753. The peak population was 17,000 in 1940. Today, the population is 6,000. You need a long-term vision for McKees Rocks. In 2003, the McKees Rocks Community Development Corporation published The Founding of McKees Rocks, Pioneering in the 21st Century, a Strategic Plan for Rebuilding the Physical Environment. The development plan featured 14 target areas for revitalization to be completed in seven phases over 20 years. You can't do it alone. A stakeholder group consisting of 15 individuals was established to guide the direction of the planning process. It included elected officials, business persons, the school district, the Allegheny County Department of Community Development, clergy, and many citizens. The strategic plan was led by the McKees Rocks Community Development Corporation. Invest in culture, heritage, and quality of life. A number of redevelopment projects were proposed in the 2006 strategic plan. In 2008, the Father Ryan Arts Center opened in an abandoned office furniture building. The center contains an art gallery, theater, dance studios, music rehearsal studios, a recording studio, art studios, and a cafe. The restoration of the historic Roxine Theater took much longer. The Roxine opened in 1929 and operated as a movie theater until 1979. In 1980, it became a banquet and dance hall. And that closed in 2003. The empty building was, required, was acquired in 2011 by the McKees Rocks Community Development Corporation. Public-private partnership was formed in 2017, 2017 to raise $9 million to create a mixed size concert venue. The building opened in 2019. The rock scene is a great success, providing spillover businesses for restaurants and bars in McKee's Rocks. It has also elevated community pride and self-esteem. Develop sustainably. Sustainable development goals include the flood uh, protection improvements on the Shark Tears Creek. You can see they had a big flood in 1936. An adaptive use of the PNLE workshops that are still standing. I'll now turn to the three small towns along the Allegheny River as a group Millvale, Edna, and Sharpsburg. Millvale is at the confluence of Gertie's Run, where it flows into the Allegheny River. It was founded in 1868. Iron and steel mills located along the river that were later, acquired, were later acquired by Andrew Carnegie as he built his empire. The peak population was 8,000 in 1940. Today, the population is 3,500. Etna is at the confluence of Pine Creek where it flows into the Allegheny River. You can see downtown Pittsburgh a few miles down the river in the top left. Etna was originally the site of Gaiasuda's town a Seneca Indian village headed by Guy Asuda, the same chief we saw earlier in 1753 in McKees Rocks. The Etna Ironworks, no longer existing, built in 1828, were named after the Mount Etna volcano in Italy because of the fire, sparks, and ash that were erupted hundreds of feet in the air every night. The town took on the name Etna in 1868 when incorporated. The peak population was 7,500 in 1930. Today, the population is 3,500. Sharpsburg was founded by James Sharp in 1826. It was incorporated in 1841. You can see Etna in the upper right of the slide and downtown Pittsburgh in the upper left. Brick-making kilns were located along the river along with several ironworks. H.J. Hines, started the Heinz Company in Sharpsburg. The peak population was 9,000 in 1930. Today, the population is 3,300. You need a long-term vision. The three towns work together on their strategic plans and zoning ordinances. Each town developed its own strategic plan, but they and their consultants worked across borders, shared data, 
and participated in each other's planning processes. As a result, there was coordination of many projects, including new riverfront trails, traffic plans, flood control, air quality, energy, social equity, and economic development. You can't do it alone. The leaders of the Tri-Borough Echo District process were the borough managers, elected officials, the business community, churches, and citizen groups. Extensive public meetings and workshops were held in each town. Grants were received from foundations, and they, they also received money from county, state, and federal redevelopment programs. Invest in culture, heritage, and quality of life. Two areas in these three towns were a particular concern, vacant buildings, including churches, and main streets. In Millvale, a long abandoned church was converted into Mr. Small's, a concert hall for traveling performers, similar to the Roxian in McKee's Rocks. The venue, the venue also includes a state-of-the-art recording studio and housing musicians, housing for musicians, both local and for touring national musicians. In 1937, Father Albert Zagar of the St. Nicholas Croatian Church invited the well-known Croatian artist Max Ovanka to come to Millvale to paint murals on the bare walls of the recently rebuilt church. The murals combine religious themes for the experience of Croatian immigrants and workers in the U.S. They are nationally significant, but by the 1990s, the murals had become badly deteriorated. The Society to Preserve the Millville, Millville Muros of Max Ovanka was created. Today, they are a tourist attraction with guided tours. David Byrne of the talk, band Talking Heads viewed the murals while on a recent national concert tour to Pittsburgh. He said, the murals by Max Ovanka are spectacular. The Diego Rivera of Pittsburgh, I would say. In Etna, Butler Street, the main commercial street, is attracting new restaurants and businesses into formerly vacant storefronts, including the fashion design store and studio of Kia Tomlin, the wife of the coach of the Pittsburgh Steelers. In Sharpsburg, there was a concerted effort to preserve affordable working housing, led by an influx of young adults to the three towns. An heroic statue of Seneca Chief Gaia Suda is located at the main intersection of the Sharpsburg Business District, proudly displayed, I should say. Developed sustainably, the Triborough Echo District has six sustainability focus areas, water, mobility, air, energy, food, and equity. Each focus area has goals and indicators to be used in metrics to measure performance. I only have time to illustrate the water focus. Like McKee's Rocks, Millvale and Edna are located on creeks leading to a major river and are susceptible to periodic flooding during torrential rainstorms. Working with state and federal assistance, Millvale and Edna are developing mitigation measures, including a network of storm water retention parks, blue streets to absorb storm water, and resorting and for importantly, restoring the natural edge of the creeks, the riverbanks. In 2019, Etna became the world's first certified eco district. I'll now turn to Johnstown, the last case study. Johnstown is at the confluence of the Connemaw and the Little Connemaw Rivers. In the center of the slide, you can see the abandoned Bethlehem Steelworks along the Connemaw. The peak population was 67,000 in 1930. Today, the population is 19,000. You need a long-term vision. In 2015, Johnstown published Johnstown Vision 2025, a reliance framework under the auspices of the Greater Johnstown, Greater Johnstown Regional Partnership. The goal was to create a framework for Johnstown's future that focuses resources and energy toward a common vision. The Community Foundation of the Alleghenies funded the plan, and the Remaking Cities Institute at Carnegie Mellon University uh, consulted on the project. You can't do it alone. In a five-month process, 26 community representatives, community representatives from public, private, and nonprofit organizations in the 
Johnstown region were interviewed in deep interviews. Nearly 100 community leaders took part in two workshops that explored the resilience framework and its implications for next steps. An open public meeting was held for further input into the framework and to invite broader participation. A governance committee was formed. Very interesting, they created capture teams around specific projects. Over 130 capture teams have mobilized in the last five years, involving hundreds of citizens, approaching almost a thousand. Invest in culture, heritage, and quality of life. Johnstown is known for the flood of 1889, as recounted in David McCullough's first book, published in 1968. A dam on the Little Connemaw River upstream suddenly collapsed. Within 10 minutes, what had been a thriving steel town was buried under mud and debris. 2,200 people died out of a population of 30,000. The Johnstown Flood Museum opened in 1973. More recent heritage projects include the adaptive reuse of the National Register of Wasser Department Store Building, restoration of Central Park, conversion of an historic house for a homeless shelter, and the location of brew pubs and small retail stores in the previously vacant downtown storefronts. Developed sustainably, flooding remains the number one issue. There were devastating floods again in 1936 and 1977 as well as annual overflowing of the banks of the two rivers. The 2025 vision plan took this on as a high priority. Unless they solve the flooding problem, revitalization of Johnstown will be hindered. As a result, the natural environment became a major focus of the 2025 vision plan. The city joined with the Corps of Engineers and the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania on a three-part process, a regional watershed strategy, a river revitalization strategy and a naturalization project for the riverbanks. These five small towns came late to the revitalization project when compared to the 30, 40 years of effort by the 10 large cities I discussed in part one. And this is due to fewer resources, no major institutions in town, years of poor or absent leadership, continuing loss of population and jobs, declining tax base, and a sense of community despair. Fortunately, they are making progress. But many other small towns in the region are still in dire condition with persistent problems of entrenched white and black poverty, race and class inequities, chronic public health problems such as obesity, asthma and opioid addiction, deferred maintenance of infrastructure and outright abandonment. And who knows the long lasting impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on these towns. Nevertheless, we can look to the recent successes in McKees Rocks, Millvale, Etna, Sharpsburg, and Johnstown as exemplars of community resilience when the right ingredients are in place. Most important, the involvement of citizens in developing and implementing a long range vision plan. None of the five towns is out of the woods yet. A casual ride through the five towns reveals areas of poverty vacant buildings, and uncared for infrastructure. But they each have a vision plan in place and committed citizens and organizations to carry out the plan year by year. The bottom-up processes and successful projects in these five towns can point the way for other small post-industrial towns across America to make themselves. Thank you for attending. And feel free to contact me by my email or by going on the Remaking Cities Institute website. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Don, for that great talk. Uh, as I get this slide up, I will uh, make sure that people who have attended this or listened to this presentation know that this is one of a three-part set. Um, this is part two. We heard from Rachel Weber in part one, and we're looking forward to hearing from Ray Gastel in part three. We'll then have all three of the presenters to have an open discussion on October 26th at 5 p.m. Eastern. Uh, to register to be part of that discussion, 
please um, register at www.ncpe.us. And you're also welcome to send questions in advance of that discussion so that we can have uh, some interesting questions to pose to all three of the speakers when we join together uh, to talk then. Thank you again, Don, and I look forward to hearing from our final speaker in part three.